library laptops and stuff. All right, so we're going to be talking about uh, containerized data persistence on Mesos with Kafka, MySQL, Cassandra, HDFS, and uh, some other goodies. Um, so before I get started, so who, well, before I, who here is familiar with Mesos? I guess after today, maybe at least some folks are familiar. How many folks are using Mesos in production? How many folks are using Kafka in production? All right, cool, great. Uh, and if you guys have questions and girls have questions as I'm going through, like let's make this interactive, you know, jump in if it's appropriate, awesome. If not, I'll follow up kind of as we're talking. Uh, so my name is Joe Stein, nice to meet everyone. Um, I started a company called Elodina recently. Um, it's a, a startup focused on supporting open source software. For the last two years, uh, we've been kind of out in the marketplace doing consulting, uh, working on some very large implementations, uh, focusing on Mesos, Kafka, HDFS, Cassandra, really implementing and kind of being the glue for companies between open source technologies and their existing data infrastructures. Um, I do some uh, blogs and podcasts online. If anyone's like interested in Hadoop stuff, uh, you know, go check it out. It's allthingshadoop.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I actually tweeted out my slides. So if you want the slides right now, just go and pull them off my Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, that's me. I'm also the Apache Kafka committer and PMC member as well, and a bunch of other stuff too. Okay, so we're gonna talk about, uh, first we're gonna talk a little about file systems, databases, object stores, storage solutions, et cetera. Kind of just talk a little bit about, you know, where the landscape is and kind of what, you know, folks do when it comes to data persistence, right? It's not just databases, there's a lot more involved. Uh, we're gonna get into uh, Apache Mesos and talk a little bit about Mesos, the architecture, how it works. And then we're gonna kind of dive into uh, Kafka, if the fates are well, we'll do a little live demo. Um, and then talk a little bit about Cassandra, MySQL, and HDFS also uh, running on Mesos and how all that works and looks and what the issues are and what you've got to look out for and what have you. Okay, so file systems, right? Everyone know what a file system is. It's a pretty simple thing, right? You've got, uh, you know, space that gets managed. There's directories, file names, metadata, permissions, um, all this good stuff that kind of goes into a file system, right? It's kind of one of the low, lowest level primitives of, you know, where you're going to store data or on some file system. Then you also have distributed file systems, right? So uh, we'll just use HDFS as an example as a distributed file system. Um, how many folks are familiar with Hadoop? Oh wow, that's amazing. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, we don't have to spend too much time then, but let's spend a little time. So the HDFS architecture, right? It's kind of, uh, and many many uh, distributed file systems kind of go along this route where they're uh, managing remote, uh, they're managing the blocks uh, remotely, right? So they have some central system in, in uh, HDFS uh, case, it's the name node that's understanding where the files are actually located within the distributed system. Um, and then it provides uh, streaming data access to be able to get to those files, right? You have all these files uh, splintered out in you know, hundreds or thousands of servers. You don't necessarily know where they are. Um, so the name node provides kind of that you know, high level representation to be able to read and write data as if it was just a file system. And it supports very large data sets, right? You know, a typical file system is gonna stop at, you know, how big your server is or how big your disk is or your RAID set. And a distributed file system is gonna be able to span multiple servers. Um, there's also a replicated log, right? So Kafka is an example of a replicated log. This is another type of uh, persistent system. And in, uh, you know, uh, Kafka's case, the replicated log is basically uh, taking in uh, immutable, non-changing data, continuously appending it to the local disk, and then you have the other brokers, the other parts of the system that are going and pulling the data from that leader for the specific partition, right? So if you kind of start to think about, you know, the two things that we've talked about so far, the distributed file system and the replicated log, like to start to get you to have like a mental picture of kind of having all this data distributed on all these different servers, right? Kind of think of it that way. Um, in Kafka's case, uh, we have uh, the replicas pulling data from the different servers, right? So the brokers need to know where the other brokers are to be able to, you know, have this type of coordination. And the durability comes from the replication, same with uh, HDFS. Uh, and then you have traditional transactional acid type databases. Um, I tried to find a picture on the internet that made this worse than it is, but uh, I think this one will be, I think this one will be just fine. And I don't know how many folks have ever set up any type of like MySQL replication or use something like Golden Gate or anything like that. 
I'm sorry, but <laughs> um, that's how you have to make these things durable, right? We're talking about files being located on different systems with potentially thousands of different clients trying in real time. And when there are failures, oh my goodness, what happens? Do I, lo do I lose my data? How do I get access to it, right? These are all the different type of scenarios that people live with today, right? These are all existing problems that folks have. Uh, and then there's systems like Dynamo, right? Cassandra, React, other, where they have a shared nothing architecture, right? So they kind of handle this problem a little bit differently, but they also still have distributed data um, spread out a lot of different places. You know, in the Dynamo type of solution, you have multiple data centers, right? Where you have clients being able to connect into a single node, and then that node that is being connected to knows where the data is, right? So you have, in Cassandra's case, you've got the coordinator, the client connects to the coordinator. The coordinator knows where the data is, is able to go reach out to the nodes that have the data, pull it back in, and give it back to the client, right? This is kind of the, you know, landscape of where we are when it comes to persisting data, distributed file systems, uh, databases without getting too much into, you know, AP, CP, and that kind of stuff. And then we have storage solutions, and this is also where it kind of starts to get really interesting, is that, you know, these storage solutions, you've got storage area networks, um, you know, they have a place and importance for a lot of reasons, mostly because uh, a lot of folks spent a lot of money on them and they're sitting there, uh, you need to read and write to them, it's important. Um, you also have network attached storage, right? Folks use network attached storage as a way to, you know, continuously scale and increase their infrastructure, especially when it comes to things like compliance. Uh, you have worm systems. Uh, you know, I don't know if folks know what worm systems are. It's, you know, uh, write once, read many, right? This is a big thing in finance and compliance and other industries where, you know, you want to make sure that the data that was written is actually what it was uh, when you come back nine years later or whatever it is. Um, and then you also have cold storage, right? So there's been a lot of really interesting stuff that's been going on with cold storage and uh, a lot of uh, new solutions that come out that we're gonna kind of get into when you start to take all these different persistent systems and start to apply it to a system like Mesos. Um, it's not just a matter of how do we get the existing system to work on Mesos, but what are the new solutions that we could actually, you know, achieve by, you know, implementing these technologies together? So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, any questions so far before we start to, you know, like jump out of the airplane, put the parachute on? Anything? No? <laughs> All right, cool. All right. <clears throat> so a quick intro to Mesos. Um, so this is what folks do today, static partitioning, right? You basically say, you know, these are my database servers and these are my web servers. And the DevOps person or whoever it might be sets up DB1 and DB2 and DB3 or they set up the journal nodes, the Hadoop nodes. Uh, the data nodes, the Cassandra nodes, the Kafka nodes, and now you've got all these different nodes that are running within your infrastructure. And um, <clears throat> if you all of a sudden need more resources, then what happens is you start to, you know, commingle um, your resources, right? And you know, I, I've, everyone knows what a container is here, right? Oh, I can solve this problem with containers. I can isolate, right, my Cassandra nodes from my web servers, and everything will be fine, right? Uh, except when that rack crashes and then you're kind of out of luck because now even though you've containerized everything and it's isolated, you don't have any failover, right? There's no recovery. Um, you have to get paged to have someone go put that server back into production. Um, it's kind of a nightmare. Um, and this is kind of when you start zooming out, right? This is more folks' systems look like. Um, you know, this could be a uh, page and you've got database servers and Hadoop servers, and they're all kind of co-mingled um, within the system. And ultimately, everyone is just overutilized, right? I mean, what is everyone at? 40%, 50% utilization, right? That's kind of the, the norm, so that if they have failure, they can, you know, ramp up or take in spikes. Um, the reality is, is that when you statically partition, you have all that wasted space, right? All this wasted space and all these different servers um, come from the lack of, you know, properly allocating your server infrastructure for the software. And when you do something with elastic sharing, right, and elastic partitioning, then the computer can figure out what's the best way for the systems to be able to, you know, maximize their utilization, right? These servers now are free to either, you know, be decommissioned or maybe run other tasks on it. It's a really, does anyone have any questions about this? This is kind of like really the, uh, you know, the meat and potatoes or tofu and quinoa of the, you know, of the system. I'm, I'm a vegan, sorry, but, 
you know, this is this is a really important concept, right? It's the it's the complete underutilization of your infrastructure, and it's not a just it's not just about saving money, right? It's a lot more than that. Um, any questions about? <clears throat> so what Mesos is is basically an operating system for your data center. The same way that an operating system abstracts the hardware from your software on your laptop, right? You don't have to worry about when you're programming. You don't have to worry about oh, what's the IRQ for you know my USB port if you just want to do something, right? You have this layer of abstraction which is called the operating system that creates that separation, and that's what Mesos does, right? It creates this level of abstraction across all of your servers at once. So when you look at them, you see it as one big giant computer, right? Uh, some of the top 250 supercomputers, at least one. Uh, supercomputers of the world are Mesos clusters, right? And basically what you're doing is building a supercomputer that allows you to run anything you want on it, Rails, Hadoop, et cetera. Um, and uh, it presents these, it presents to the software um, the underlying components as resources, right? CPU, RAM, hard, di hard drive space, et cetera. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. Um, this is my obligatory slide. I, I truly believe in Mesos seeing all the things, right? It's the same way that, you know, when Linux came out, when it came out, um, and everyone got all excited, you know, we could, you know, run a real server and real software on it, and it's, you know, it's great, it's open source, right? Uh, Mesos is the same thing, in my opinion, right? We now have an operating system that allows us to build supercomputers. Uh, this is the architecture. Uh, so, let's quickly go through this so that we can kind of understand a little bit more about how the, the rest of the systems are going to work in the frameworks. So <clears throat> at the core, you have uh, the Mesos master. And the Mesos master is basically the coordinator for handling all the resource allocation and scheduling between the Mesos slaves and the schedulers. Um, schedulers are basically intelligent systems that are able to understand the applications that they're launching on Mesos. The applications that they're launching on Mesos, they launch in what's called the executor. And the scheduler and the executor together are called a framework, right? So you have these frameworks that run on Mesos. And a framework could be for any system. You could have a framework for Kafka, framework for Cassandra, framework for Hadoop, a framework for MySQL. And what these frameworks will do is they'll have a scheduler that will be intelligent, understanding how to handle things like failure recovery, how to handle specific semantics for that application. Um, and then the executor will launch on the slave node, um, being able to handle whatever is local to that specific application. And kind of what happens at a little bit lower level here, uh, between the scheduler and the slaves and the executors, and kind of how all this is really where all the magic happens. Um, you have this thing called the allocation module. And the allocation module within Mesos, uh, first of all, it's pluggable, which is kind of cool. Um, second of all, it handles all of the um, distribution of offers. So an offer comes from a slave, and the slave says something like, hey, I've got you know, 36 gigabytes of RAM and 8 CPU. You want it? And the Mesos master doesn't say anything, because the Mesos master, it doesn't want the resources. But it will go to each scheduler and say, hey, do you want some of this? You know, do you want some CPU? Do you want some, you know, you want some gigabytes of RAM? And the scheduler decides. You know, maybe the scheduler doesn't need all 36 gigabytes of RAM and 8 CPU. Maybe it only needs 0.2 CPU and 500 megabytes of RAM because it's running Nagios or whatever, right? So very fine-grained uh, resource allocation is controlled through the system. So the framework the scheduler says, hey, you know what? These are the resources that you've, you know, I see the resources you offered me. Here's what I would like to launch. And then the master goes and the slave launches them, launches within the executor, and then the task for whatever was being launched um, starts running on the slave. Oops, there you go. Um, let's keep drilling down. Uh, two components of Mesos that I'd like to talk about, uh, three really, uh, we'll talk about the third in a second. Um, so resources and attributes. Uh, so resources are really anything on the computer. Uh, CPU, RAM, you could actually make anything you want a resource. Uh, but for now we're going to talk about CPU, RAM, and disk space. Um, and then we have attributes. Attributes are basically sh strings that you set slave that then get passed back up through the master to the scheduler. And this is really important because 
when you, let's say you have a thousand machines and you want to launch, um, you know, let's say a Hadoop cluster and it's going to be a three node Hadoop cluster. Um, and you've got uh, slave 789 have the data nodes running and they all reboot. The schedulers need a way to know where that data was originally, right? It's kind of a very intuitive concept, but something that, you know, maybe don't get right away. Um, so attributes are a way to be able to tell the scheduler a little bit more about the, the hardware, right? Is this hardware really something that is for the system that I'm trying to launch, right? Let's say you're, you want JBOD or you want SSD. You could set attributes on the machine to basically tell the schedulers more about that machine and the criteria that's on there, right? Maybe you need a RAID 10 for, uh, you know, 14 disk, 15,000 RPM setup, right? It's not just about having a terabyte free of space. You actually have specific criteria. Um, maybe you want it so that when your, your persistent services are running, you want them running in different racks, right? If you have 100 nodes, you don't want all 100 nodes running in one rack because if you lose the rack, they all go down, right? So attributes are basically a way to start to divvy up and, and, and separate and give the scheduler the ability to know where to launch uh, its tasks and do it in a way that is, you know, right now manual, right? Someone will go and say, oh, we need to launch a new XYZ server on rack one because the rack one server died. Mesos can now do this automatically for us, essentially. So any questions on, re on attributes? All right, let's talk a little about roles. <clears throat> so roles are, <coughs> excuse me, roles are a way in Mesos to do uh, static reservations. It's basically the way right now to stop starvation from happening because Mesos will send offers to any framework, not just the one that, you know, lost the task. So if you have 20 different frameworks running and let's say one of those frameworks was for Kafka, and uh, a server goes down and comes back up, the data for Kafka, for that service that went down, is on that server, right? So ideally, you want to be able to launch that application back on that server, right? You don't want to have to stream two, three terabytes of data through your network for absolutely no reason. The problem is that if you don't reserve those resources beforehand, when that service comes back up, the master is going to take those resources and potentially send them to other frameworks. So, you know, the server goes down, comes back up, you freed up, you know, dozens of CPU and hundreds of gigs of RAM, Spark might get it, Storm might get it, you know, and Kafka might never be able to run another broker on that machine. So there's a primitive called roles that allows us to basically say, okay, I want to set um, two CPU for my infrastructure, kind of like a management NIC, you know, like in a server there's the NIC card that no one touches, it's for like the management NIC. You do the same thing with roles, right? You say two of my CPUs is for the infrastructure team and eight of my CPUs is for uh, data services and then the other, uh, you know, four CPUs are for anything else that wants to consume them. And then do the same thing with memory, right? So you could actually go and separate out um, different pieces of your infrastructure. If you're running on AWS, uh, you could actually set up different cloud formation groups that are for different roles. So let's say you have a Spark job, job running and you just want to now maximize more of the Spark job, or you have to have, um, you know, more web servers being able to scale out, you could actually launch your CloudFormation templates with roles as well, so you could actually scale out the different parts of your infrastructures, um, you know, without having to affect the other resources. There's a lot of really cool tricks that you can do with roles, but right now it's, it's the only way to do um, reservations of resources. Um, not currently. Yeah. Yeah. So right now, that's a that's a task in the life cycle of releasing. So one of the things that you kind of have to do is look at your uh, workload pattern for whatever service you have and see how under allocated you are and squeeze down that you know top number as much as possible. Right. So if you launch you know a web server with eight CPU and fifty gigs of RAM and it only uses two and six gigs 
you have to lower that setting, right? Right now, that's part of the operator knowledge and the life cycle of, you know, what is our cluster, what does our allocation patterns look like? And that's what people do, right? And a lot of folks actually can get their allocations like up to, you know, above 90%, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and one, and one very, very large implementation, I think they're up to like 96 or 97% uh, allocation. So, yep, yep. Uh, you can do that. It, uh, how you do that, though, is dependent on how you've done your implementation. So there are schedulers that will actually, the Aurora scheduler is an example for that. So Aurora scheduler does preemption. So you can set things like, this is a production task. This way, if a part of the production system goes down, tasks that are not production just get killed off, and Aurora will go and schedule that. You can build an allocator module to do the same thing as well. Right, so in the allocator module, you can kind of look at all the tasks that you want um, and create that type of preemption and priority. There is no current, you know, high level, magical, every single task gets a priority, not, not yet, um, but you can, you can build the system to be able to, to do that type of thing. So both uh, uh, quotas, preemption, um, and priorities. They're all, they're all existing implementations that you can look at and either use, right, like you could use the Aurora scheduler, or you can see how the Aurora schedulers implement it and, you know, just implement that yourself. All right, um, so there's some new features that are coming out in Mesos which are pretty exciting. Um, really, the, the first two for me are the most exciting. Um, hopefully they'll come out in 0, 2, 3. Uh, so the first is dynamic reservations. So everything I told you about with roles, and uh, uh, st uh, static assignment for resources, that'll all be dynamic now, uh, moving forward. So when a scheduler launches and it consumes some resources, it can basically say, reserve this. And then the master will not send that resource to anybody else, and it will be kind of you know, dog-eared for the scheduler that asked it for it to be reserved. Right? It's a very, very powerful primitive to making this data persistence be really easy. Right now it's not complicated, but it's not trivial. So, um, you know, this feature in 023 really will make and change the way that folks can run data services on Mesos because it'll just, it'll, it'll just work without really having to understand a lot of the internals. Um, and then the second is uh, uh, persistent resources for storage services. Long story short, you can basically mount uh, a local, a local uh, path into the sandbox. So um, let's say you write some data in the sand, I'm, does it, people don't know what the Mesos sandbox is, I guess, I haven't brought that up. Yep, okay, cool. So when a Mesos task launches on the slave, they actually get their own little isolated sandbox. And that isolated sandbox, you can go and put and do anything you want in it. You can download the JRE, you could run your own, it's a container, right? Uh, the, Mesos, the Mesos implementation is all LXC, it's all containerized, it's all isolated. CPUs, they're in C groups, MEMS in C groups, and you've got this little sandbox. And that sandbox is kind of where you do all of your local writes. When the task dies, that sandbox is gone. All right? So if you can imagine, in a data persistent world, when you lose a task, your data disappears. Ah! Right? <laughs> it's a little scary. So you can work around that today, and we'll talk about a little bit of how you can work around that. Um, but this feature basically makes it so you, do, you no longer have to work around it. Um, the workaround is pretty simple. I mean, you just write outside the sandbox. It's not that hard. <laughs> you know, you just agree and have some place on your local file system, slash mount, slash disk to, slash Hadoop. Um, most people will namespace it, so you can run multiple different clusters of things. Um, but that all will all go away, and it'll just be a, a volume that you'll have that you can mount inside of your sandbox, which will be pretty nifty as well. A um, lot of other things, like when you have, if you're using OpenStack or EBS or have some, um, you know, volume mountable drives, you can take those and mount those in the sandbox. Uh, so a lot of cool features. Um, and then another nice uh, primitive that's coming up is add resize task. I don't know or think that'll be in 023, but I guess we'll see. Um, and basically this is being able to uh, deallocate, it's kind of going to your question, deallocate the resources on demand. So if you launch a server and it has eight CPU and 36 gigs of RAM, 
if you want to change that, either lower it or increase it, you have to kill the task. That's not ideal, right? You just want to be able to say, you know, we do, especially in data persistent services, like anytime you kill something, it's not ideal. So, right, so here you can lower the CPU and lower the RAM without the tasks actually having to die. Again, these are really nice to have. None of them are required to do all the things that we're about to talk about, but it definitely makes it a lot easier and a lot more fun. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about Kafka with Mesos. Okay, so uh, Kafka with Mesos, uh, our team's been working on this for a long time now. Uh, we started using Kafka on Marathon. Marathon is kind of like the init, init D for Mesos. Uh, we started doing that about a year ago. And like four or five months ago, we started on this path of building a Kafka framework. Um, we're at the point now where it's, and it still says beta, um, we're, we'll be cutting that over in the next few days. Uh, just when we get time to do an official release. Um, this is kind of what the uh, architecture looks like. So you have, um, here's the Mesos master, right? And then we have, let's say, two Mesos slaves. And then we have the Kafka Mesos scheduler and the Kafka Mesos executor, right? So those are the two parts of the framework. Um, and then the Kafka Mesos scheduler exposes a REST interface that allows our CLI to hook up to the REST interface as well. And then the executor is basically responsible for managing and launching brokers. So we have an implementation that allows us to schedule brokers on Mesos, right? Mesos will find the place where they go based on attributes or size of the system. And the executors will start the brokers and launch the cluster essentially. And then once that happens, all of your existing Kafka tasks, creating topics, offset checking, producing, consuming, all of those work exactly like they do today. Nothing is different whatsoever. The difference is, is that we're now able to make Kafka uh, elastic, right? It's not just set up three brokers and they sit there with only, you know, I don't know if anyone's run Kafka brokers in production, but you know, they don't always, they don't, not, they're not gonna necessarily consume all your CPU, right? Uh, you have a lot of wasted CPU. So you can run other things on those machines. Um, you know, here the brokers are isolated, right? So their CPU and RAM will be isolated and you can give them the disk that they need and, and make sure that they have the right, you know, amount of IOPS that they need to be able to do to write all their data. All right, so when we set out with this, we had a couple of goals. Like we weren't just trying to build and say, hey, how do we force feed and shove Kafka on Mesos? We really wanted to look at all the operational headaches and trouble that you know, the 30 or so different companies that we have worked with have had. Um, you know, one is the broker ID assignment. I have seen people create broker IDs out of all sorts of things. IP addresses, random numbers, uh, just crazy stuff. Um, and this is a really important thing in Kafka because when a broker goes down, you need to be able to bring another broker back in with the same ID in order for the replication to happen. Um, and if you have an auto-scaling group, it's non-trivial to do that with the auto-scaling group. Basically, if you want to do it, you know, very hacky, but make it work, you have to use the uh, IP address for the broker ID, right? So when you bring the machine back in, you know, you bring in the same IP address, and then the broker ID is, you know, the, the, the machine. Um, it's really hard to use systems like that. It's very difficult, in my opinion. So one thing we wanted to do is make the whole broker ID assignment and that entire process just under, under the hood and work. Um, second, we also wanted to make sure that we were able to preserve broker placement so that if brokers did fail, they would be able to restart in place to exactly where the data was. And we also wanted to be able to do config changes on the fly. Um, so many times you've got to go in, especially when you're building up a new Kafka cluster, and you just want to change some configurations. If you have 20 nodes, there's no reason to go and run Puppet or Chef and then restart all the servers. I mean, it, it really is a pain. Uh, so we really wanted to ease the administrative bur burden for configuring Kafka and doing things like rolling restarts. Um, we also wanted to make the, the brokers be able to scale up and scale down automatically. And the scaling up and scaling down automatically, like really making these brokers elastic, is not so much just about in load coming in and, and uh, you know, like if you look at a utilization curve, right? When the sun's above the Pacific Ocean, your traffic's at the lowest, right? Um, we wanted to make sure that we could shut Kafka brokers down so that the resources that Kafka brokers were using could be used by other people. We really wanted to be good citizens that if the Kafka brokers weren't needed, 
right? Maybe you need more brokers on Black Friday if you're an e-commerce business. Fantastic. Hit a button, scale them up, use them. And when you're done, hit a button, scale them down, or have a programmatic way to be able to do that. Um, and then we also wanted to do some other sp smart partition assignment and a bunch of other stuff as well. So these were really all the goals that we set out with and you know, is, are all part of the existing implementation. All right, so a quick little bit about the scheduler and the executor. Uh, so the scheduler is gonna provide us all the operational automation for the Kafka cluster. It's kind of like the, the brains of the operation, right? So every scheduler in Mesos really is, understands the system that it's launching and it's working with how it handles failure scenarios and everything else. Um, our scheduler also exposes a REST API and CLI, which we'll look at in a second, um, to do everything that you need to do, essentially. Um, and, and you can run it on Marathon for high availability. This way, if the scheduler goes down, no big deal. Another one starts up and the whole cluster doesn't have any downtime. Um, the executor, is, the executor is, pretty, is pretty dumb. It just runs the Kafka broker and then talks to Mesos and the broker and, and handles the restarts and the controlled shutdowns. Uh, very, very simple part of the system. Um, also to note that uh, the Kafka Mesos framework will run any version of Kafka. So if you use the Confluent version, awesome, it'll work. Uh, if, you want, if you're still using 0.8.1.1, that'll work as well. Uh, if you wanna roll your own version of Kafka and apply a patch or put something else in there like uh, different metrics, uh, you could do that as well. So it just takes any Kafka binary and, and we'll run that broker essentially. Uh, it's really good for testing as well. All right, so the CLI and REST API. We really wanted to make sure that the, administrative, the administration of the system was just dead simple um, and, and really easy for folks. So uh, the scheduler, so you can start the scheduler um, and then you have the ability to add brokers to hopefully uh, the fates will be willing and we'll do a little demo here. Um, you can go ahead and add brokers. Uh, you can update uh, resources, right? So this is not just CPU and RAM, but these are also things like configurations as well. Let's say you wanna ch change like the log retention bytes. You can go ahead and just do that from the CLI and um, uh, stop and start all of your brokers. Uh, it's very, very, very simple. Uh, you could also just take brokers out if you need to take brokers out. Uh, we also have some nifty uh, rebalancing features and then a whole bunch of other stuff that you can see just from the help. Um, and everything that we have in the CLI is also exposed through uh, REST API. So any programmatic access that you can do manually, um, any, anything that you can do manually can be done programmatically with um, REST, REST requests. Um, and it's really simple to launch brokers. Um, let's see if we can go ahead and uh, do that. Uh, can everyone see? All right, so I'm gonna start up the scheduler. And that's it, All right? So the scheduler starts. Uh, we'll make sure that we see resources coming in. All right, cool. So we see that we've got, uh, you know, a little over half a dozen CPU, almost 10 gigs of RAM, a whole bunch of disk space and some ports, right? So this is, these are the offers that are coming into the scheduler saying, hey, I've got resources for you. So, Let's go ahead and, uh, um, all right, so we're gonna launch, uh, we'll add three brokers. Um, so by adding the brokers, we're just telling the cluster these are the brokers that actually need to be there. So we'll go ahead and add three brokers. That's it, they've been added. And now we can go ahead and start the brokers. So it takes a couple seconds, but um, I mean, if you can imagine like, you know, someone said to you, oh, I want you to stand up a Kafka cluster. It's gonna take a little bit longer than this just took. <laughs> so, and that's it. Oh, I guess I launched four brokers, I forgot. There you go. So we've launched four brokers. And that's it. These are now four Kafka brokers running just as you would expect them running and working today. And if you wanna know where they are so that you can go ahead and, you know, work with them, just go ahead and do a status. 
Uh, we could also be curled. Right, so you can get a JSON, so your software can get this information, and here's your service discovery, right? Here's your broker endpoint running on different ports, and you can go ahead and start producing and consuming from Kafka, just like you do exactly like you do today. And when all of a sudden you need to launch another node, pretty simple. Let's go ahead and, uh, uh, let's see. Go ahead and launch uh, a couple more nodes here. Let's say we just do want to do one more. So let's go ahead and add one more node. And start it up. And let's say we decide that you know 0 0.1 CPU is just not enough, right? Um, that's fine. We can go ahead and run the same updates, make changes to the cluster. Um, you know, very very simple operations. I'm gonna keep going. Jump to some other systems quick. All right, so let's talk uh, Cassandra with Mesos. All right, so there is a Cassandra framework for Mesos, which has just recently recently been released that gives you all the goodness that you get from Cassandra uh, running on top of Mesos. You can go ahead and check that out. There's a scheduler. Uh, the scheduler, like the Kafka scheduler, is very intelligent. It understands everything that it needs to know about Cassandra. It understands the concept of the rings and the nodes and how to deal with failures. It understands that maybe when you, just like the Kafka scheduler, that when a node fails, you don't necessarily want to start that node somewhere else right away, that you want to wait a little while and see if the slave recovery has happened before you just go ahead and you know, move terabytes of data across the network. Um, so the Cassandra scheduler is, uh, you know, a lot of work's gone into it, and it's, it's, uh, it's really getting there. It's, it's pretty cool. And then the executor, understands a lot more about uh, the specific Cassandra node that it's operating on. It's able to interrogate it, pass that information back up to the scheduler for people to access and monitor it. And then uh, HDFS on Mesos. Uh, this is, to me, very exciting, right? Being able to launch a distributed file system on Mesos is, is awesome. Um, for me, the most exciting thing is being able to create a cluster, put a petabyte of data on the cluster, and then shut it down because you don't need to access it. And then when you do need to access it, turn it back on, right? So there's a lot of really cool solutions that you can get into when you start thinking about what does it look like putting a distributed file system on Mesos? Like what do I actually get from it? Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can get from it. Uh, so this is a very exciting part of, uh, part of the ecosystem, at least for me. And then there's MySQL with Apache Mesos. Uh, so MySQL and Mesos, this came out of Twitter. Um, so Twitter open sourced it. Uh, it's on its way incubating, incubating with Apache. Uh, the vote passed, so it will be a incubation, an incubated project. Uh, but you can check it out now. It makes it crazy to go ahead and launch a MySQL cluster. Um, just a couple buttons, and then all of a sudden, just boom. Just your MySQL, your MySQL cluster is launched and running, and now you can go ahead and just insert and select to your heart's desire. They did a really great job with it. And it's uh, written in Python, which is cool too. Okay, um, before I get kicked off stage, because uh, I think we only got a couple minutes left, does anyone have any questions? Yep. Uh, the question was, how does the mashing between the offers and tasks happen? I'm not sure what you mean by mashing. Yep, so, yep, yeah, so the slave sends the offers through the master to the scheduler. The scheduler says, hey, I have a task that I want to launch, sees if the offer is less than or equal to what it wants, and then requests that to happen, essentially. It requests the, the launching to happen. And then the slave gets the mandate to start the executor with those resources, assuming that it's there and <laughs> it's not, you know, hasn't crashed or whatever, and then the task launches based on the resources that the scheduler said to launch with, which is not necessarily what the resource offer was, right? If, you need, if you're the scheduler and you need one CPU and a gig of RAM, and I send you an offer for you know, two CPUs and five gigs of RAM, that's great for you, right? You can, launch on, you can launch on my machine, essentially. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but.
Uh, so the attributes, the scheduler gets to see the attributes, right? So the attributes are just strings that get passed through. The, ma the master doesn't really look at them at all. But when you get them in the scheduler, you're able to see the attributes and you can build software that can now, because don't forget, the scheduler is a single piece of code, right? So we could actually see all the different offers that are coming in. What are all the different statuses at all the different pieces that are running? What are the attributes on those? So the attributes are in the resources, right? And it can actually look at that and make whatever intelligent decisions to when deciding whether or not it should accept an offer, right? So like if, if a, like I said, when a slave goes down, you may want to be able to just, you know it went down, alert saying the back plane crashed. And you don't want to wait the 10 minutes that the scheduler is going to wait. So you can change the constraint, right? So there's two parts, there's the attribute and the constraint. The attribute comes up through the task to the scheduler, and then there's the constraint that says, how do I want to apply my tasks to that attribute, right? Do I want to say, you know, unique host name, meaning this task, task will own, there will only be one running on every machine, ever. Or do I want to cluster by rack, which means if you have three racks, it'll put the task, task one, task two, task three, task four, task five, task six, right? So you have a lot of different ways to control the constraints on where the tasks end up based on the attributes. Um, if you want to know more about that, Marathon, the Marathon documentation is great for that. Um, we, the Kafka, we use the Marathon constraints in Kafka, and I think most people end up using them. Um, they're really great. Check that out. I kind of feel like it does that already. So, question. So, the the schedulers themselves. Uh, I mean, you can have thousands of different, you know, executors running on a on a slave, all doing different things, all with different workload patterns. Right? You could have your, you know, MySQL, Kafka, web servers, you know, all in separate containers running on that machine, essentially. Um, yeah. It, 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 it does that from that perspective. But it doesn't do it from the VM perspective, it does it from the container perspective, right? All in C groups, all in the kernel. Sure. Yeah? Yeah, so we do some Docker stuff on Mesos. Um, uh, you can take the schedulers and run them as I would advise to maybe not do that with the uh, executors and the tasks. There's a couple of, you know, at least in my opinion, there's a few little alleyways that you have to contend with with Docker in production. The number one is that the daemon, when the daemon dies, all your tasks die. And that's very anti-Mesos in my opinion, right? When you have tasks running in Mesos, if this Mesos slave process dies, your tasks still run, which is huge when you're trying to do an upgrade. Imagine you have a fleet of servers and you're trying to do a rolling update. When you do a rolling update of your software, you don't want every single task to fail. Right? So let's say you want to upgrade Mesos, all your tasks still keep running. If you want to upgrade your Docker version, you have to kill your tasks to upgrade your Docker version. Like to me, until that gets fixed, I, ha I have a lot of issues putting persistent data and even some other type of data in Docker in production, uh, just from that perspective. That's, that's uh, yeah, that's my opinion. But it's still great. It <laughs> besides that, it still has a lot of usefulness, right? Like if you're okay with your willy nilly and it's you know you're fine with that, maybe a web server or some other system or whatever it is, it's fine. It's good in testing and development, um, you know. And, and as long as you know what you're getting into, then it's okay, right? As long as you know that when you upgrade the machine, everything's going to fail. Just don't upgrade your Docker version, and then that won't happen, right? So there's a lot of different ways to contend with that. Um, if you're willing to take the trade-off of it, it's worth it. But you have to know what the trade-off is, and that's the trade-off, essentially. Yep. Uh, I prefer rather not to say, and <laughs> that's okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a there are quite a lot of like mind-numbing Mesos implementations that are out there. Like I said, like in the top 250 supercomputer size. Um, it's uh, it's quite incredible. Yeah, it's it's kind of also nice when you just get like 5,000 CPU to do anything that you want, and then every developer could have thousands of CPU and hundreds of gigs and even terabytes of RAM, 
just isolated for their own tasks, right? I could be working cluster, which is completely different than your Hadoop cluster, and we're running on the same, you know, infrastructure, right? You don't just, all of this is isolated and separated. You just run multiple clusters, right? You want your own Kafka brokers? No problem. Spin them up. Two seconds later, have your own Kafka brokers, whether it's in development, testing, or even in production. Um, you know, all of that becomes uh, very fluid and very simple for folks. And it spins up very fast, too. Right? It's not a, it's a container, right? It's not a VM that takes minutes and days to boot and then crash. <laughs> and then boot again, then crash. Right? The container, just it, it just runs. I think I'm getting kicked out. Nope. Oh. All right. <laughs> Does anyone have any more questions? Yeah? Also, since integrating the system. Um, so Mesos does the containerization for you on launch. You don't, you don't have, there is a little bit of effort that you have to do to get it so that it launches, but you don't have to, like if you just have to put it into a tarball. And then the executor downloads the tarball and then runs it. And that, it runs it in a container. There's not a lot, there's not a lot to it. And it's great, so the systems like Marathon, so Marathon is a system that can just start and stop services. Let's say you have a web server or a web application, or even like Node.js. You can have all of that download into the sandbox and start, and it starts in the container. There's no prepackaging that you have to do except to zip it up. Sure. Yeah, there, there, you, you will have to do some work to get it so that you can have all your dependencies packaged in that one piece. And then in cases like that, it may make more sense to take the trade off and put it into Docker. Because if it's such a complex dependency that you've got to do all this testing, it may be best to test into a Docker container and then just launch the Docker container on Mesos. There's all those folds that you Dockerize it with, but not Dockerize it. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, that's a good way to go about it. Um, I, I, I think that's a, a fair, you know, try to make it Dockerizable. Um, and you can get the benefit without Docker, and then if and when you do need it, you can use it. Um, after you do it a couple times, it actually becomes pretty simple. Um, you kind of get used to, you know, what, what are the piece parts involved to do that. Once you start downloading your JRE and running it locally, you just keep doing it, <laughs> right? Once you've done it once, you're able to, you know, reuse and do it again, essentially. Any other questions? Anyone want Kafka, Kafka stickers? Yeah, I'm gonna be around for a while, so you can come catch me. So just before you all go, coffee break time now.